Right. OK, so what I'm going to be talking about for the next 40, 45 minutes or so is really around how our self-image and how we view ourselves shapes our lives and our realities, really. And I have the term here, psycho-cybernetic, so I'm, I'm drawing on that term and, and the book around that psycho-cybernetics. Um, drawing on some mentors, maybe, and people I would consider teachers. Not that I've necessarily been in a room being thought by these people, but read their works, listened to what they had to say, and also just drawing on my own experience through life, through coaching, through my experiences. Um, so some of it will be based on theory. Some of it will be based on my own reading and my own perceptions of um, these works. So we will have a look and I'll introduce some of who those teachers are and an introduction to psycho-cybernetics, where the term came from. We will have a look then at seven components of a successful personality. Um, so Maxwell Maltz, who coined the term psycho-cybernetics, talked about these components of um, successful personality. We will talk about visualization and the conscious and unconscious mind what the differences are between the both and how we can harness almost um, the power of the subconscious. And then, as I said, I leave time for questions and then we will wrap up and close. OK, so as I said, just before we have an hour this evening to get through this. So, as I said, um, thinking about where yeah. some comes from um, I think back on my own life and from a very young age maybe my late teens early 20s I was very fascinated with philosophy ecology human behavior spirituality consciousness many different kind of facets that I was really passionate about and also how the different areas intersected with each other and I remember from a very young age, listening to some of these people, I would find YouTube clips and um, listen to their works. And as you can see, a lot of them um, are black and white kind of old photographs, not a very diverse looking group. Um, a lot of these teachers would have been around in the 18th and 19th century. So the top here, we have James Allen. Um, he wrote As a Man Think It. Um, Napoleon Hill. So one of his great works was Think and Grow Rich. Some of you may be familiar um, with that work. Again, that was in the early 1900s. And what he did was he studied many of the great thinkers or the most successful people at the time. And he followed them around for years and, and he discovered that there were these principles that they lived by. Okay, there was these common denominators that all these people were living by. Um, in the bottom left-hand side, we have Dale Carnegie. One of his works was How to Win Friends and Influence People, again, in the early 1900s. Um, we have um, Bob Proctor, so he was more recent. Um, and in the middle, then, we have Earl Nightingale. Very unusual, kind of distinctive voice. And... As I said, I, list, I used to kind of drive, I'd be driving at the time I was teaching then and I studied philosophy in, at university for a while and I would I really soak up the messages. And what I was fascinated by was that even though we might say that this is quite a while ago that these people came up with these concepts and ideas, is what, that it seems, to, it seems to permeate into the modern day. And almost most of the works that I, I was studying in more current times seemed to tie back to these same ideals. Okay, it was almost this kind of common thread that was weaving through. Um, in more recent times then, um, you might be familiar with Dr. Joe Dispenza and his work, I can see some people nodding. Um, we had Jose Silva, and in the top right, we have um, Helen Hansel and 
Helen Halsa kind of drew on Jose Silva's work and she was known as the competition queen. And from around the 60s to the 80s, every competition that she entered, she won. Every competition without fail. Um, she even won a house. And when people got really, when she won the house, it was around the 80s, people got really fascinated. And, you know, news page, she got a lot of attention because people were wondering, how can you win every competition that you've ever uh, entered? And she gave some of the techniques that we're going to talk about. She said that, well, what I do is I really imagine having won the competition. So when it came to the house that she won, she said that I imagine living in the house to the point where I actually chose the furniture. She got the blueprints for the house and, and decided which room would be which, where she would put the furniture. So that's how much she really embodied uh, having this house. And in the end, she actually did win the house and many other things throughout her lifetime. So psycho-cybernetics then. This was a book written in 1960 by Maxwell Maltz. And the term itself almost uses the, the metaphor of this kind of machine, if you like, or how we might program a machine. And this cybernetic function that it has to have a particular goal that it's aiming towards. So it's almost like if we program a computer to do something, we give it a goal and specific tasks to reach that goal. And interestingly enough, uh, Maxwell Maltz was a doctor but he wasn't a doctor of the mind. So he wasn't a psychologist or a psychiatrist. He was actually a plastic surgeon. And when he worked on his patients, he recognized that many of them came with maybe what they perceived to be disfigurements. Maybe they didn't like their nose or possibly they had a scar on their face or something that they didn't like about their physical body that they wanted to change. And very often these things were holding them back in their lives. So it was really impacting their self-image, oh. the world, how they interacted with other people, confidence, self-esteem. And Maltz would operate on these people and, and fix, if you like, for once for a better expression, fix what they perceived to be their shortcomings, their physical shortcomings. And what he found was that some of the people would go on to live really, really rich lives. So if he, um, if they had an operation on whatever they perceived it was that was holding them back, some would go out, go on to be confident and, and live really successful lives. And another part of the percentage of people who had these operations didn't. And he started to get really curious and, and, and think to himself, what is the difference in the people that fix their perceived limitations and go on to live these successful lives and the people who don't? Because ultimately, the outside circumstances weren't changing. Their in, inner personality or their IQ weren't necessarily changing, but there was something that was changing. And he based a lot of his work on these observations. OK, so observing these patterns in his patients. And he went on then to do a lot of work around self-image. Because what he believed was the difference was the person's self-image was changing. Okay, so he was changing the physical reality, but ultimately what happened when that happened for some people was that some people it would shift their self-image and for others it didn't. And he really became fascinated with this idea of self-image and how actually our self-image impacts everything we do, how we show up, what we believe about ourselves and the world around us. He believed that we have this image of ourselves and it impacts how we show up in the world. And very often this image is very ingrained in the subconscious mind. OK. And the subconscious mind doesn't know the difference between what's real and what's imagined. 
So it doesn't know the difference between re what's real and what's imagined. So I'm just going to share an image, but this is this is actually an image um, that Bob Proctor created. And he often said, you know, no one has ever shown us an image of the subconscious mind or the mind itself, you might say. We all know the mind. We, we have we know what a brain looks like. And um, but when it comes to our minds, we don't. And he created this image just as a visual to help explain. So what you can see here is that we have there's three different. Sorry. We have our conscious mind. And the conscious mind is where we do our thinking, our rational kind of conscious thinking. And we perceive, if you like, through our different senses. So what we hear, see, smell, touch, taste. And it's a thinking mind. And with our conscious mind, it can either accept or reject an idea. Okay. So it has six intellectual factors. So we can use our imagination, intuition, reason, will, memory, and when information is impressed with repetition and very importantly, strong emotion, it's passed on to the subconscious mind. So it might not necessarily be something it could be if it was very emotionally charged. It might not be something necessary that happens once, but something through repetition or that we have a, a strong emotional charge to can be impressed then on the subconscious mind. So. Can you think of, so maybe you have things like, um, I'm not good at maths, or I'm terrible at languages. Or maybe I'm not good in social situations. I'm not, really, I'm, I'm not good at public speaking. Okay. So I can see some people nodding. So many of us will have those beliefs. And if we actually stop and think, where do those beliefs come from? Was it from maybe a teacher in school who told us we weren't good at public speaking or good at languages? Was it maybe friends that maybe picked out a particular trait they perceived in us and maybe said that thing to us again and again? Or maybe we had a very emotionally charged experience where we were standing on a stage and got stage fright or many other different experience that we have through life. And through that experience, whether, as I said, repetition or a strong emotional charge, what happens is those things are impressed on our subconscious minds and they become beliefs. OK, they become beliefs. Those beliefs could be impairing beliefs. But they can also be very self-limiting beliefs. The subconscious mind is, is more about feeling than thought. And it's, you might call it our emotional mind. It works in feelings. And the subconscious mind, very importantly, must accept all information impressed upon it through repetition or emotion. And it controls the vibration, the energetic vibration of the body. So when you think of some of those beliefs that we have, whether it be a teacher or a friendship group, a colleague in work, primary caregivers when we were very young, very often the people that might have almost planted, probably unconsciously as well, those thoughts in our subconscious mind may not have been very qualified to do so. OK, so maybe someone looked at a picture we drew in school and said, that's absolutely awful. You're no good at drawing. And all of a sudden, then we carry this belief through life. I'm no good at drawing. And that will impact how we show up in situations in life. And then we have the body, OK, so our physical body. And this, that's the action. And again, a very important aspect of this, the doing part of our personality. The vibration of the body is decided by our thoughts and what's held in our subconscious mind. The body controls the action and behavior part of our personality. So we could almost say that the conscious and subconscious mind, it's almost like the conscious mind is the gatekeeper. Because if we, if the subconscious mind has to believe everything that we impress upon it, 
we almost need this gatekeeper to be able to rationally assess, yes, this is possibly true. What evidence do I have? So it can, it can assess and weigh up the options. And with repetition, again, it will be impressed upon the subconscious mind. So how does this relate to psychocybernetics? What Maltz found was that we almost have this kind of mechanism whereby we have this self-image of ourselves. And it's not the external environment, but it's actually our self-image that creates our results. So it might be, to use the example about languages, that something happened in school where someone said you weren't good at languages, you've created this belief around that. And actually, as you go through your adult life, maybe you do some traveling or you do a language class. Um, and because you have that belief that you're not good at languages, you're less likely to put yourself in positions where you might practice languages. So or it's almost like this self-fulfilling prophecy. It, it might be almost like to use a metaphor if, if you turn the, the dial on the oven to a certain temperature, and if you maybe get a little bit impatient like me sometimes and you open the oven door to see how things are cooking, um, what will happen is the temperature of the oven will drop. But as soon as you close up the oven, that mechanism, because you've set it to that particular temperature, the oven will start to heat up again to bring it back to that natural point. And likewise, that's what our self-image is doing. And I became fascinated with this because, you know, as I was not only moving on from kind of listening to those teachers when I was in my teens and 20s and then um, being in the classroom as a classroom teacher and only teaching, but also studying the behaviours of the interested in uh, how the students kind of related to one another and how what they believed about themselves was impacting how they showed up. And then when I went on to, to coach and the experiences I've had in the coaching space, but also studying positive psychology and hypnotherapy. And I felt like it all really was saying the same thing to me. I could see the same pattern coming up again and again. That's what we believe about ourselves that really determines how we show up and what we achieve. And Maul said that we're actually as humans, goal oriented beings. OK, so we naturally um, strive towards goals. And he mentions this idea that, you know, if you think about a squirrel, a squirrel has never been thought that it should go and um, take acorns and store them away for the winter. Um, I remember actually my dad saying to me one day we had a, a we have our dog, we have our dog. And he was saying it's amazing that he was taken as a pup from his mother and didn't have anyone to show him what to do. But yeah, he knows to go out the back and dig and hide the bone and all of these things that are inherent in animals that they haven't been shown how to do. And Mal said that we have this as humans, but very often our conscious mind gets in the way. So maybe you can think, have you experienced a time when you maybe had a very strong intuitive pull towards something? or a strong intuition that maybe you wanted to write a book or start a podcast or ask someone out, whatever that might be. And then all of a sudden the conscious mind kicks in and starts saying, oh, what if this happens? And it starts trying to protect us, maybe talk us out of it. Very often we can listen to that conscious part of our minds. I see this play out a lot in my own coaching sessions and not only in my coaching sessions, but in my own life, where as I, uh, began to start studying all of this. And even before that, I might have certain goals. So it might be that I had to study for an exam or it might be that I wanted to get in shape or lose weight or write a paper for college or whatever that might be. And very often, you know, let's say in the example of getting fit, it might be OK. Less calories in, more calories out, exercise, eat less. It's not rocket science. Seems very simple. Why am I here again and again every Friday saying I'll start on Monday? Okay. 
Um, and I'm wondering if you think to yourself, have there been times when you know what you have to do? It's not, you know, sometimes there are more complicated things that we face. Sometimes it's this frustration around, I know what it is. I know what it is that I have to do, but yet I'm not doing it. Not only do I know what I want to do, but actually it feels really important to me. And still here I am again, I'm not doing it. Um, we often see it even with money. So we might have a particular self-image around money and, and our earning potential. And what can happen is, even if you earn a lot more money than you did before, you still seem to have the same balance in the bank account. Because either what will happen is you'll spend more or you will create a different lifestyle. Because again, what will happen is, like the oven metaphor, our self-image will always bring us back to the temperature that we've set. Um, also, I, you know, I've seen the show of my clients where, again, they might know what they need to do. But again and again, for whatever reason, they don't seem to be able to really achieve those goals. Um, I also do a lot of work with, with men in prisons around the UK. And it really is um, it really shows up there again and again where we often talk about labels and the labels that we give ourselves or the self image that we have of ourselves. And this idea that someone might label themselves as a criminal or a prisoner or think other people, that's all they see. Very often we can go out and almost live up to that image. Likewise, if we have an image of ourselves as a really healthy person who is fit and healthy, that image, again, will lend to de very different behaviours. So Maltz also talks about that, that, that this idea of a successful personality. And these are kind of components that we need in order to reach those goals or have, a, as he called it, a successful personality. And it, it kind of spells out the acronym success here at the sides. So he talked about that we need as humans to have a sense of direction. So as I said, this idea that we need a goal or a purpose to strive towards. And more importantly, he said that it's very important that that goal is our own goal. It's not a goal to, he believed that really our true goals and purposes come from the subconscious and not necessarily from the conscious mind because very often our conscious mind can come from a place of keeping up with the joneses or wanting the car or the house or the relationship because society might tell us we want it but he believed that this sense of direction really needed to be very true to who authentically who we are The you then, he talked about understanding. And this is where we need to understand when we're almost distorting our view of reality. When possibly our fears or our desires stand in the way of what's true. Okay, so like I said, maybe we have anxiety around public speaking or um, starting something new. And we might think, oh, we might catastrophize or think, you know, it'll never work out. I can't do it. And actually, that might not be really true. So we said that we really need to be reflective of ourselves and, and ask ourselves, are my fears or my desires getting in the way of what's really true? He talked about courage and that we need to have the courage to go where we haven't been before or start something new. And that actually, there never is a perfect time to begin. Okay, so if we want to change something about ourselves or do something new or achieve our goals, actually, the courage part comes into it in knowing that there never is a perfect time to start. And sometimes we just have to begin and trust that we will, you know, make our way as we go. Because this idea of having this sense of direction and goal, it's almost like we can't possibly, the rational mind or the conscious mind can say, this is the goal I'd like to achieve. This is the change I'd like to make. And it can make a rough kind of a plan. 
But ultimately, there's no way the conscious mind before we've actually done something can think of all the different complexities and nuances and failures that will happen along the way. So it can't make a very uh, comprehensive plan. It's almost like we have to set out on the path and trust that as we go, we will learn what needs to happen next. So this whole idea of psycho-cybernetics is um, like a plane, or this was around Maxwell's time, it was kind of more related to missiles, but actually that when it sets off on its course, it has to keep consistently and constantly self-correcting. So that we, we know that the, the end goal, but we don't really know the path to get there. So it's almost like we really have to acquaint ourselves and get friendly with failure, you might say, because very often on that path, it's, there's more failures than successes. And it's actually the failures that put us on the right path. So it, you could almost remember that childhood game of um, hot and cold. Maybe some of you may have played it where one person would hide something in the room and then the other people would either say you're hot or you're cold. So it's almost this idea that we set off on the path to find what it is we're looking for. And along we'll either fail and that's just a, a way of saying no, cold, and put us back on the path. And then it'll be like you're a little bit warmer now or a little bit hot. And again, that's when we have the successes. So it's, it's, it's as I said, being really acquainted with this idea that failure is almost more important than success at times. The next C then is charity. And this is where we give and attend to the needs of others. Okay. And it, it also can tie into esteem as well, to our sense of self esteem. So, actually, that we can be happiest, if you like, when we are using our gifts to serve others. Then we have esteem. So, having a high opinion of ourselves. Okay, so having a high opinion of ourselves. Self-confidence then, I'm missing the D in there. Um, so self-confidence, self-confidence can come from remembering our successes, remembering possibly when we feel we've been a good person. So remembering and bring to mind what those successful times were can help us with self-confidence and then self-acceptance. So the self-acceptance part is around accepting who we are for all those failures, for all of who we are, with all our imperfections, our quirks, everything that's good and what we might perceive to be bad about ourselves. So accepting that all of that makes up the package of who we uniquely are as a human being. Um, so as I said, Mods believe that these were the components of that successful personality. So it feels like in, in one way and, you know, in my own experience of working with people um, and in my own experience of life, that it can be one thing to know that we have a limiting belief or possibly something that's holding us back. We might have this revelation um of yes this is what's holding me back oh, wow I have this limiting belief that's held me back all of my life and now I know what it is and that can be a wonderful revelation sometimes we might also get some insights into possibly why we have that limiting belief possibly where it came from and that can also be um a really valuable insight but it feels like a very different thing then as to, okay, well, what do I do with that information? I, I know I have this limiting belief. I know it's holding me back, but where do I go now? Because again, if we are moving with this idea that this is at a, these beliefs about ourselves, this self-image is at a subconscious level, well, then it can be harder to just change instantly with our conscious mind. So again, I'll kind of pose this scenario or the question, have you had moments where you might feel that you're not good enough about something or that you're holding yourself back for a particular reason. And you have that recognition 
And even though your mind is saying, let's say to use the example of public speaking, where you're about to stand up in front of people at work or on a stage and, and speak, and your heart is beating, maybe your hands are kind of sweating, um, and it literally feels in your physical body like you're going to die. And yet your conscious mind is saying, what? this is ridiculous. I, these are my work colleagues. No one is going to kill me even if I make a mistake. Why am I feeling like this? So the conscious mind, even though we know on a conscious level it's ridiculous, very often that doesn't do a lot to calm the subconscious in that moment. So what can we do? Maswell spoke about this in terms of the power of the imagination. And he said that we are all hypnotized. And it's not necessarily, you know, stage hypnosis, um, although that can be wonderful too. I was actually at uh, Darren Brown. He was in London there just a few weeks ago. I saw his show, um, even though I was trying to figure out all the techniques he was using. But that's not the, the hypnotizing necessarily I'm talking about, even though it stems from the same um, school of thought. It's this idea of self-suggestion. So we're constantly being hypnotized, whether it's through advertising, through things other people say. And this idea of hypnosis is, as I said, not this stage hypnosis, but anytime you're in a very suggestive state. And what I mean by that is anytime our conscious mind is not running the show, Okay, so it's not on high alert, kind of as the gatekeeper. That might maybe times when you're just about to nod off to sleep. Or you're in flow. So you're in this state of flow where you're just really involved with what you're doing. Or sometimes even when you're driving, and I'm not suggesting that you don't know where you're going, but it's almost like we get into this very relaxed, comfortable state. And at that point, our subconscious is very, very open to suggestion. And what Maud suggested is that we need to get ourselves into that very, very relaxed state. And when we're in that relaxed state, at that point, we use the power of our imagination to imagine what we will be like when we've achieved that goal. What would it feel like? How would I respond to the situation? If I'm that person, so if I need to maybe change, what are my values in that very moment in time? And again, going back to this idea, it's very, very important that we have an emotional charge to it because that's the aspect that will impress it upon the subconscious mind. It's the repetition and the high emotional charge that helps it sink into the subconscious. So it could be if you have a particular goal in mind or you have a presentation coming up or whatever that might be that you realize a self-limiting belief is holding you back from, that you spend a few minutes just before sleep or take time out in the day where you really get into a very, very relaxed state. This was also, um, interestingly enough, what Joseph Silva talks about in his technique that Helen Handel used to win all those competitions. It was exactly the same thing they were talking about, getting into this very, very relaxed state when you're in a relaxed state, you use the power of your imagination to impress upon the subconscious mind. And in doing so, you create a new self-image. Very often this can be looked on as kind of woo-woo when we talk about this idea of, you know, use your imagination or um, a law of attraction. And that's become probably more pop, more popular in, in kind of recent years. That's only one of the, the cosmic laws, if you like, the law of attraction. There are others. But again, it's almost like you see the same thread weaving again through and through of um, the power of the subconscious. And there have been many, many different research and studies done on this idea of the power of the subconscious there was 
a study done around um, Olympic weightlifters. And they were hypnotized before competition. And the suggestion was that they were so weak that they wouldn't even be able to lift a pencil. And these are people, as I said, who would lift a massive amount of weight in these Olympic competitions. And after that suggestion, literally, they weren't able to lift a pencil. Now, nothing had changed in, in their physical form or their stamina, but actually it was that power of suggestion. And there are these studies again and again that really demonstrate how the subconscious doesn't know the difference between what's real or fake. It might be um, that one you've probably heard maybe where you imagine yourself making yourself a nice drink. So maybe you're making yourself a nice soda water on a really hot, sunny day and you pour the water over the ice cubes and you slice some lemon to put into the drink. And as you look down at the lemon, you can really smell the zest and you take it in your hands and you take a big bite out of the lemon. And what can, you know, when we do that, almost we can salvate just thinking about the idea of biting into the lemon. Or it might be you're walking home at night and it's a dark night and you hear footsteps behind you. And all of a sudden your heart starts racing and you start thinking that someone is going to attack you or that you might not make it home. And again, nothing is actually happening. It's this picture that we're creating in our minds. And it's actually the picture or the visualization that causes the reactions, not the actual reality. So I would invite you to think about where you might be creating these scenarios for yourself in your own lives, or I, I know a lot of you on the, the call are coaches with your clients as well. How is it showing up in the space? Do you question where those beliefs or thoughts come from? Like when you say, I'm not good at languages or I'm not good at speaking with new people or whatever those beliefs might be. Do you question how true they are. I'd also invite you to take stock of the thoughts that you're thinking on a daily basis. Because again, it's through this repetition that things are programmed into the subconscious mind. What are you thinking as you're maybe drifting off in work or driving somewhere and cooking the dinner or whatever that might be, start to notice what those automatic thoughts are that are going on in your head. And are those thoughts aligned with what that purpose or that goal is that you want to achieve? Because it's actually the power of this consistent conscious thought is what will get you to your goal eventually. In my experience, very often, it's not this conscious hard work that we put in to achieving it, even though as we look at this diagram, that is a very important aspect that we do need to take action. So you could say something like going back to this idea of the law of attraction or, you know, where people were told, oh, sit and think about and believe it and it will just come. That is an important aspect that we need to believe. We also need to take action towards those goals, physical action with our bodies. So generally, it's not this thing that we just turn up for. Um, I would suggest that we work as hard as we can, prepare as well as we can for what that goal is or what we want to achieve. But then we need to at some point surrender and let go and let the subconscious mind make suggestions and show us where to go. We need to fail and fail again. And then just come back to center because the failures actually shows where we need not to go and how we might need to change course. But very often what we do is we let the conscious mind trick us into thinking failures means we got it wrong. Or we might not even start because we're afraid of failing. Um, I thought it was really interesting. I've just literally come back yesterday. I was on a, a week long retreat and I knew I was going to be talking about this this evening. So it was percolating on, in the back of my mind. It was there. and. Um, I was talking at, on, on the last day we were doing some sharings and I was talking to this gentleman who is about to set up this really kind of new age technology in um, California. 
And as we were having the conversation, I said to him, well, how did you get, you know, where did you come up with that idea? And he said, well, what I do is I relax, get into a really, you know, I sit and relax. And I imagine, I know I hadn't spoken about this talk or anything about it. I hadn't even mentioned it. But he said, I imagine myself in the future. He said, sometimes it could be 50 years, sometimes 100 years. But I imagine I'm 15, 16, a teenager in that time. And I imagine what gadgets I will have. I imagine what my friend, who my friends would be, what would be the in thing at the time. And he said, and I sit there for about 20 or 30 minutes, just imagining. I take some notes and then I meet with my team and, and I seem to have lots of ideas. And it was just this real uncanny moment, as he said that, that I was thinking, wow, this is literally what this is saying, that very often plan what it is that you want to do. And the subconscious and different things will almost kind of show back to you where you need to go next. Not only in what he was sharing with me and how, how his process worked, but also in me being able to use it as an example, as I share it with you now, um, even though I was at something totally unrelated, that that kind of resonated with me in that moment as a really good example of how we can use the power of our imagination and visualization in order to be able to change some of those outworn limiting beliefs, but also to help us to reach uh, those goals that we want to reach. So I'm going to pause there because I did say I'd leave some time for any thoughts you might have, any questions. Um, so I'd just like to open the floor to those now. So I see, um, Alina, do you need to question the statement that I can achieve anything that I put my mind to? So I'll ask if you'd like to maybe write the messages in the chat or the questions in the chat, should I say, and I can kind of read them out to the group. Um, so do you, need to, do you need to question the statement that I can achieve anything I put my mind to? So I would, you know, in terms of this work, and again, you know, there's many different ways to answer that question. Um, there might be limitations. There might be actually very real environmental, physical limitations that we might have, financial limitations. But actually, a lot of the limitations are our own minds. Because why not give it a try? Why not believe that you can do it? Other than the fact of kind of jumping off a cliff without a parachute and, and tempting gravity. Um, but, you know, in terms of going for your goals, I would ask yourself, how does it serve you to question the fact that you can do so you can't do anything that you put your mind to? It do, with this, it doesn't mean that it might not be difficult. And there might, as I said, I would expect more failures than successes. That's a good sign along the path. Um, but I mean, there's countless examples of, you know, the, the one example, the four minute mile was it Robert Bannister. Nobody believed that you could run a mile in under four minutes. I think they said that your internal organs would probably burst. And then he went out and ran a mile in under four minutes. And then within weeks and months, um, lots of different people were doing it. So there can be lots of science to back up why we can't do things, but that's only until it's proven wrong. And then possibly you could be the first person to do it. Michael? Hello. Hi, Lillian. It's good to see you. This is very nice. Thank you. Um, my question is around the word failure. Um, I've, I feel like in my life, um, the word failure has this sort of negative connotation. Like I failed, I something failed that I was involved in things like this. And, and as I've, as I live my life, I feel like I see so many times where something just doesn't work out for many different reasons. And I'm just wondering if you might speak to um, ways maybe in your experience um, where to move away from the word failure and helping people with re um, phrase examples like this. Yeah, great, great comment. Yeah, I would agree. I think the, the word failure can have this almost this kind of resonance with us that we feel and we've done something wrong and it can kind of have a lot of emotional charge to it. You could, I mean, you could just change the language if 
that's what worked for you. What's important is having that emotional resonance or that energetic feeling. Um, so you could change it to what not to do. And we could and we could sit here all evening and brainstorm different phrases. But for me, what feels important is changing the relationship with the word failure, with the concept of failure itself. Um, because sometimes, yeah, we have some nice phrases here. We win, we learn. Yeah, absolutely. Really nice way of putting it. And there's many different nice ways we could put it. But for me, it feels like we almost want to look that in the face. What is that fear? Why do we have this aversion to the word failure? Because it feels like still we're suppressing it by saying, OK, we put a different, nicer kind of phrase or a prettier word on it. Well, then we're not we're still not talking about the skeleton in the cupboard, which is I might fail on this path. And what does that mean about me if I fail? Because it, it, it's almost like we want to detach our self-esteem from the outcome. So, again, as I said, you could decide to there's no right or wrong in this. You could decide to change the wording or you could decide to look it in the face and say, what is it about this that's making giving me this really strong um, energetic feeling about that word? Because generally there can be a lot of insight around unpicking what that might be. And sometimes in order to get comfortable with failure or with this kind of learning curve that we're on, um, we have to kind of look that in the face and know that it's not comfortable to not get it right. It's not comfortable to embarrass ourselves or to not do as well as we hoped we'd be. But as humans at this stage, we know that that is a very, very important part of the course. Um, if you even look at professional athletes, you know, maybe strikers or even baseball players you'll see that even the most successful of all time the hall of famers if you like those were the ones who maybe got the most goals or hits or whatever it might be but they were also the ones who missed the most as well because it's only by missing that we learn actually that's not how to do it that's not the way to do it and we can keep on going um thanks michael Lenka. So if you can unmute yourself. Yeah, I just tried that. I'm sorry. Tech, tech issues. I'm on my phone because my computer was uh, slowing down your voice and I was breaking up. Super fascinating. Um, I have one question. Uh, so I work as a futurist and we do this time travel a lot uh, with organizations um, to help them think of innovations, but also to help them transform. One thing that your model or uh, Maltz's model brings forward is uh, the idea of get yourself in a relaxed state. And I know I, I was just once watching a TikTok video around the SIVA method um, and SIVA or SILVA method, I think it's called. Uh, and they talked about relaxed states in terms of uh, Tesla uh, waves, like the brand wave length. Mm -hmm. So when you say a relaxed state, do you mean that? Brain, um, brainwave state, which is actually super rare and quite difficult to get into? Or do you mean something else? Yes. So great question. So it is altering almost kind of the, the brainwave states. But my suggestion would be, you know, they've obviously done a lot of research where actually it can measure the exact state that the brain is in, like similar to when we fall asleep, that we go through different cycles and um as we sleep and the brain, when we measure the brain in that state, it will be different levels of relaxation. That said, we, generally, most of us don't have that kind of equipment to measure and to get that specific about it. So absolutely, that is what's happening. But generally in, in daily life for most of us kind of going through, getting ourselves into a state that feels just before you nod off to sleep. So that feeling where you're literally kind of a little bit drowsy, the conscious mind is not really um at play almost as, as well when you wake up in the morning you know when you wake up in the morning it might take you a couple of seconds or a couple of minutes to realize where you are or to, just as you're coming awake it's before the conscious mind that would be my suggestion um i'm sure there's lots of kind of further work you could do or maybe you could go to actually get those brain waves measured um so yes that is what's happening but in terms of how i would apply it i would literally just whether it's meditating for you being out in nature, 
lying down somewhere comfortable and just getting yourself into a relaxed state. What you're aiming for is to kind of quiet down the conscious mind whereby you're very, very open to suggestions to the subconscious mind. Does that answer your question, Enga? It does. And the reason I was asking was because I was thinking, how on earth can you get the decision makers before the time travel into a relaxed state, um, which may be very difficult in an organizational environment, for instance, close your eyes and meditate in front of your colleagues and bosses, right? Um, and I was wondering if you have an approach because I know about the falling asleep or waking up or um, meditating bit, but I was wondering, is there another, sorry to say, shortcut to, to that relaxed state that could be applied even in a coaching session with a client, I can imagine, and or organization? Mm -hmm. So there, I mean, there are, I know there are, whether it be on YouTube or different things online where you can't, there's actually kind of um, music that can get you into that state of resonance. So, you know, you can pick different hertz and different kind of waves where it will help you get into that state. Uh, for me, and I know, you know, as I said earlier on, some people can look at this stuff and say, how does that work? Because for me, I'm really passionate about this work because I feel like it's such an, an understudied and um, we don't really talk about it a lot, whether it be in business or in corporations because of people want to it's, it, the conscious mind is in control all of the time I need to have a 12 point plan and I need to know what we're doing and when we're doing it and those you know it's not to discredit that those things are important but I really don't think that we look inwards enough and look at the power of the subconscious mind and actually research shows that the subconscious mind is probably running 80 to 90 percent of the show anyway and yet we don't really understand or are able to articulate in a way of what, what is that? What is going on? What are the relationships between the conscious, the subconscious and the action of the body, let's say. Um, so if you, if you, in my suggestion, as I said, there are definitely things where you can bring yourself into those kind of brainwave states. But I would also sometimes be brave enough to name it as it is, because you might get someone that kind of just runs with it and that could set a ripple effect. Uh, because for me, this work is really, really powerful. Um, and sometimes we need to just kind of yet yeah, talk about it as it is and hope that maybe the right people will pick it up. Thanks, Lenka, for your question. Any other thoughts or questions? I'm just going to read in the chat box. OK, so we're just about on time. And before we wrap up, I shared a link. So you get some um, credits, CPD credits for joining on the call. So I'm going to share that link with you for those of you who may have joined us a few minutes in. Uh, so that's the link to your CPD um, credits. I'm just going to send also my email so I can share um I can share the slides I will just pop my email in the chat you can email me for those slides I did have a link uh, but when sorry well, Lillian. I think there is Britain who tried to um she's raised her hand to just something yes so I'll take it in a second so I'm going to share my email so if you do want the slides I will um email you on that email address email you on the email address you send me um, and I will take you in to share a comment in just a second. So, is Brittany, do you like to share? So is it... Sorry, Gerald, did you say someone wanted to share? I can't see any hands in the space. You, I might not be able to see all your faces because I'm sharing. It's, um, it's Britain, Britain Kitten. Britain Kitten, would you like to share? At the top. I don't know, I'm seeing it. And they've said that they have 
some thoughts to add. Yes. I'm not speaking. Okay. Speak. Speak now and forever hold on. Now saying, now saying hold on. She's obviously, well, they've gone. Maybe in my They said hold on. I can share something while we're waiting. I don't. Hi. So, which is just there's a lot of chat here about the word uh, around failure. And my thoughts on that are, is that our stars are aligned because it seems to me that the word failure is having a little bit of a moment. You know, there are podcasts built, you know, very successful podcasts built all around it. You know, people who've decided to do something on failure, I don't know if anyone on here is, is familiar with Elizabeth Day, but, you know, she had another, you know, failed relationship and decided that she was going to, you know, start a podcast on how to fail, um, starting with herself and her, you know, perceived failure. Da, 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 da. Well, now, hello. I mean, it's become, it's become, it's eclipsed all of her journalism. <laughs> it's eclipsed everything she's ever done before. And then it's led to you know, a, an incredible turn in her career. I mean, um, and so I think that, and also it's just something that everyone's talking about now. So I think that we're in, we're in a really good place to start embracing failure and having a go. And, um, and I think that my thoughts are regarding this, is that line between where some, some people look at that, you know, manifestation and manifest, which is also having a little bit of a moment with, books that have been brought out recently um I think that some people look at that as you know woo woo and some people will look at it this way and you know there's talking about it this way the science behind it and the um, psychology behind it I think it's um and also with the animas call I mean I love doing that on, on our module six doing that future pacing which is uh what's come up uh I think that it is really having story. I'm just looking at Elizabeth Day's number face coming up. Uh, uh, coming up. Yeah, so I think it's having a moment. I think it's something that is, is really, I'm, I'm hearing it a lot, or maybe it's because I'm learning so much about it. Maybe it's through, through that, that the law of attraction is I'm seeing it everywhere, but I think it's certainly failure and having a go and socialising your brain to just get used to having done it take the scariness away I think it's um there's lots of tools out there for us thanks Joe yeah absolutely and you know like words are neutral in a way the actual word itself is neutral it's the meaning that we attach to the word failure that can mm. like so yeah that's a great idea to kind of fail as much as you can um yeah I remember was it um what's the lady who owns Spanx her name is oh yeah 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 she says it also yes she's yeah. her name is uh Sarah right. Sarah. Banks. yes her father, she said yes her father used to sit at the table every day and when they have dinner he'd say um go around the table and rather than say how was your day he'd say tell me one thing each of you failed at so each day they would have to, go to school and he would celebrate whatever it was that they told him to fail that yeah yeah Brit yeah Brit Thanks, Joe. Britain, hopefully we can hear you now. Do you want to give it a try? We can see you at least, which is wonderful. No. What a pity. I, I wonder if you tried without the headset or maybe if you wanted to type it in the chat and I can read it out to the group. And I know we said we'd be here for an hour just Two minutes after eight, so if you do need to pop off. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Well, I can't hear you, it seems. Turned on my Yeti. <laughs> okay. Um, so in my work, I do a lot of phobia work. Um, I'm an animal phobia therapist, but actually I've become a bit of an anxiety expert in general because all my clients have anxiety issues. So I'm quite holistic in my treatment. And going back to the idea of fear of failure, because this is a big one. Um, so the way I'm teaching it is this is part of the three caveman mindsets, really our survival instincts. And the fear of failure goes, um, it's a survival instinct because 
when we were cavemen, literally failure meant rejection from the group. Rejection from the group meant death. So mm -hmm. our subconscious minds are, are take, is taking failure as death, literally translating failure as death, which is quite extreme. But our rational, you know, conscious mind knows that's not true, but we're very confused about the extreme reactions we feel around failure. Um, so it is literally this primitive because our, our subconscious mind doesn't realize thousands of years has gone by and that we're no longer living in this primitive setting where, you know, we can be rejected. It's OK. It's not pleasant, but we don't die. <laughs> Um, so it's all about seeing failure as just part of the journey and exposing yourself to allow it and embracing that feeling. Um, and just, I tell, I have my clients write just mantras about accepting, you know, it's, it's part of the perfectionism mindset. Um, one of the caveman mindsets, perfectionism, letting go of the need to be perfect and, and needing to never fail. Basically failure is a good thing because without failure, we, we won't grow and, and evolve as a human being. So it's about just shifting it in a new light, like, oh, failure, that's that's all right. I'm just going to gain experience. I'm going to learn. I'm going to grow, accepting it part, as a human condition. So that's my two bits. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, glad, though, I'm glad you're able to unmute yourself. It's a really nice point. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, again, the subconscious mind doesn't know that many years have passed by I and mean, it's still um, can be quite primitive. Um, but, yeah, absolutely. Sometimes we literally do feel like we're under attack when we're in those situations. Um, so, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Anything else anyone would like to share before we begin to wrap up? OK. So, um, as I said, I would invite you to start noticing maybe what those automatic thoughts that you're having on a daily basis. Notice maybe when you're having and um, those strong reactions. Going back to, to summarize, it's almost like we have this, as humans, we need this goal that we're striving towards. We're naturally goal oriented beings. Um, like when, if you got into the car and put just driving, where would you end up? It's almost like we need to put a destination into the sat nav. And like that, if we, I'm sure maybe we hit a bit of traffic and we take a, a different turn and all of a sudden the sat nav will reroute us back to the goal once it knows what that destination is so we, even if we go turn down a side street which we might call a failure because we're not on the same track that still will bring us back because we've set the goal in place so importantly have a very clear goal in mind know where you're going but know that at the initial stages you can't have a complex map as how to get there because things will change as you go and just readjust as you make those little failures or kind of veer off the path know that when we think of psycho cybernetics or an airplane 90 percent of the time it's actually off track and it's those little adjustments along the way that bring it to the final destination so um as i said i've shared my email please do um i'll ask you to email me rather than type your email in here because i lose the chat once we close up so if you email me i will um email you those slides and i will um send you on um the books of those people that I mentioned earlier on but for now thank you all for being here tonight lovely to see you all and um, hopefully you will have some takeaways and be able to put some of this stuff into practice and um, yeah have a lovely rest of um, the day.